Welcome to Life is Spiritual presents the Erica documentary number 17. We glorify the name of the Lord and we thank God for this far that he has brought us, Ebenezer. And I'm Bamboo, also known as Brother Tim. And I'm here with my beautiful wife, Erica. Erica Mukisa Kimani, a.k.a. Mama Maisha O Mami Zion. Yes, and I'm Baba Zion. And this is documentary number 17. Glory to God. The Gods of Egypt. And before we begin, we would just uh, like to uh, present a, a note of caution for uh, any children that are might be in the room or might be watching. Parental discretion is advised. This is for 18 years and over for adults. So parents may want to consider whether they want their children to hear this. Um, there's, of course, not going to be anything lewd or... Uh, deliberately uh, pornographic or anything like that. However, but they need parental guidance. They do need parental guidance, and so it is at your discretion, parents. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So before we begin, we should pray. Yes. Yeah, it's very important. Very important. We've been praying before we got here because this is not a small topic, mm-hmm. and it's not a, it's not something small. This is a big deal. Yeah. So we are praying and we prayed for this broadcast and we've also prayed for you, but we will pray again. Yes. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Mighty Father, in the name of Jesus, we give thanks for the gift of life. Yes, we sir. give thanks for the gift of righteousness through your son, Jesus Christ. Yes, we give thanks for the information, for the knowledge that you have given your children yes. and we may share it that we May all turn to the Lord Jesus with all our spirits, souls, and bodies, with all our might, and that nothing should derail us. Mighty Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over every viewer, spirit, soul, and body. We pray, Mighty Father, that you would surround them with a wall of fire, impenetrable from every or any side. We pray, Mighty Father, that there shall no evil befall them, neither shall any plague come near their dwelling. We cover even their dream life, that even after this, that their dreams may come from heaven and not from the God of this world. Yes. We thank you, mighty Father, for the opportunity to share this truth and to share the history of this world and the history of the fallen ones. Yes, Lord. We pray that the Holy Spirit may have the preeminence here and take over this conversation and... May it edify and encourage and build up the saints that their faith may be strong and their roots may be deep in Christ, that they may be as the setters of Lebanon that cannot be moved, that cannot be shaken with every new wind of doctrine. We pray that Jesus may be glorified and that the church, the body, may be edified, and that, Father, that you may be glorified. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen Amen. and amen. Yes, um, we've been sharing, I've been sharing my experience, and my husband has also been sharing his experience and backing it up with the word of God, and we are so grateful for the fact that God has brought us. We did not do this to chase clout or to to get a following. We just wanted to share our experiences and use them to help other people probably who are going through whatever we went through and to encourage somebody out there that if we overcame, you can also overcome. And about us keeping quiet as long as we have a voice, we shall never stop ashaming the devil because we overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And today I'm still here to share my experience and together with my husband, we'll be uh, talking about the Egyptian gods and explaining to you how they affect our day-to-day lives. And you know, as children of God, we need to walk in light. We, we we need to know these things that the enemy doesn't want us to know. We need to know his secrets. And when we know that, then he's powerless. He's so defeated because you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So anybody that is out there waiting for us to shut up, we are not about to shut up. In fact, we have just begun to shout and say that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is 
more powerful than the devil. If he, he helped us to overcome whatever we were in, you will definitely overcome. So I'm continuing with my uh, testimony. My grandmother had gone so deep into uh, serving the devil. In fact, I just wish sometimes she had an opportunity like mine to get delivered and also share her side of the story. But unfortunately, my deliverance led to my grandmother's death. And even the Bible, when the children of Israel were being set free, Pharaoh had to die, you know? So uh, there were so many covenants that my grandmother had put me in and uh, and I was so, so bound. It only needed Jesus to set me free from those covenants. Now is when many things are becoming more clear to me. It's when I'm beginning to understand. As, as you get to learn the word of God, you get to understand things better. That's why I encourage Christians, go into the word. Spend time in the presence of God. Spend time praying, listening to also other ministers. You know, you get to open your mind and, and understand the Holy Spirit is real. He'll help you understand these deeper things that the enemy doesn't want you to know about. So I used to see my mother, my, my grandmother do certain things to, to people and I had no idea of what she was doing but at least I would see the result. Everything she would do would happen to them like the words she would speak upon people's lives would automatically manifest. I would find those people suffering the same things that my grandmother was sending them. For example, like during the full moon. My grandmother uh, would get, you know, when somebody is going to bewitch someone, they, the enemy will always ask for a point of contact or bring that person his bra or bring that person his panty or bring that person his photo, hair, nails, anything that is connected to that person and then leave the rest to me. Come back after this, this time. And my grandmother would assemble all those things during the full moon and then she would perform rituals. And one of the things I saw her send, spells I saw her sending to people were spells to uh, play with people's mind and cause people to run mad. And also epilepsy. She used to send it also as a spell. And indeed, it would end up affecting somebody. Somebody is born healthy and normal, no sickness. And then all of a sudden, the person becomes epileptic, like she starts uh, falling all the time in fire, in dangerous uh, places, things like that. But what she would do is this. For those people she wanted to bewitch so that they ran mad, she would get their photos and then she would make declarations upon their photos during the full moon and she would burn, uh, she had herbs. She would burn the herbs together with the photo and assemble the ashes after she has drawn a circle and, and put that uh, hexagram in the circle and then she puts some fire and then she starts now cast, uh, casting spells and burning the photo with that fire that isn't is isn't then she assembles the ash and then she creates a doll out of banana fiber and in the head is where she puts the the ashes that she assembled and then she would go and plant that doll it can be something small not something huge mm -hmm. she goes and then she plants it on a banana plantation and then she makes declarations that uh, every time during the full moon, the madness will increase. And as that doll is being blown by the wind, is how that person's life is going to be. It's not going to be a settled life. So a person begins to now move aimlessly. They begin to talk without uh, control. You know, a mad person, how they behave. They talk they, to themselves. Yes, they, be, they begin to undress and do things. Misbehaving. Uh, yes. Uh, misbehaving yeah and uh, and then there are those that she wanted the madness to result to their death she would get the the, the that uh ash and put in a doll the doll representing the person that she's bewitching if she wants a person's hand to be to be painful she would twist the hand and here physically the person will be screaming in pain and uh, she would, if she wants the leg, she would fold the leg and physically the person would be in pain because of the point of contact, which is the photo. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she would get that doll and bury it by the grave. Uh, 
meaning that the person is going to be mad and probably run into a car and get an accident and die and say people will say a mad person was knocked yeah that person was not supposed to be mad it is as a result of witchcraft that that person is suffering then um she used to send my auntie who was her she also uh, died but my auntie was like a, a priest or priestess because she was serving at the altar mm-hmm. yes and my grandmother would send her to go to the to the Nile river during the sunset when when the sun is setting the, there's a certain light that the sun the sun gives and then that water you know from the sunset so my aunt would go and collect that water in containers and then bring it for rituals uh, on how to program people's lives yeah so let's say somebody has uh, seduced a husband but this husband comes to them just for fun and then goes back to their family they would go to my grandmother and then my grandmother would give them that water from from that river mixed with herbs and then tell them to use that water to prepare the man's food or juice anything that he likes and when after they have declared words on that water when the man drinks the water he settles this side and he doesn't want anything to do with his family anymore and uh, he even doesn't remember that he had a family yeah so they they would do so many things to to twist the minds of people and to disorganize people's destinies but among the things that my grandmother did is something that i shared in the in the previous documentary 16 i shared that my grandmother uh she used to wake up at around uh at around 4 in the morning and then she would go to that hill where she would meet a snake and that snake they would sacrifice a uh, chicken and feed it the snake had four heads so they would sacrifice chicken my uh, my grandmother when i said they my grandmother and my auntie who died also mm-hmm. so they would sacrifice the chicken they would offer the egg and the wine to the snake so that snake would 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 eat that chicken and all that and after they perform ritual now during the time that the sun is coming out that is now when my grandmother would get a list of of people that she's bewitching mm. and then she starts making declarations calling their names and making declarations among the words i had her say is that let the sun feed on your sweat and that is the most most terrible thing i have ever seen my grandmother do because just imagine someone goes to the field to work and they are, they are they are carrying their family in their mind and they are working so hard so that they can make make ends meet they can provide for their family they can you know their children are maybe they need to go to hospital they need to go to school he needs to bring food on table and he cannot but he's not uh failing to provide because he's he's lazy but because somebody has uh programmed the sun rays or the god of the sun to send evil spells against that person in everything that they do and no matter how intelligent and how hard working they are that nothing that they would do that would materialize into anything so people would be laboring and laboring and you would see like in life we have seasons there is seasons when we gather when everything is just working smoothly and then there are seasons when you are surviving on what you gathered so now if you cannot gather during the time that you're supposed to gather then it means when you're supposed to survive on what you gathered still there is nothing to survive on so your life is going from bad to worse and not that you are not educated not that you're not hard working but because there is an evil witch that is sending spells to work against you sending the sun rays to just collect your sweat or your blood you know a person is working and working but there's nothing to show for their labor in the same place the person is working there are other people who are working there and they are they are, they are driving they're they are building progress. they are making progress but 
no matter the attempt a person puts in, nothing is coming out. And then also, she used to also use witchcraft using birds, like pigeons, and then also owls. She would get tarismas. An owl. Yes, an owl. Yeah, and then she would tie it on a on a pigeon. Okay. And then she would send this pigeon to go, let's say, to somebody's place of work. Then maybe these people are competing in in a government office yeah. and one of them has or is my grandmother's client and she wants the position so what they would do the person that they want out of the way they would send um charm through the pigeon and maybe they said they have given that person four days to be fired from the job now this pigeon will be flying there at the office like for those four days and every time it does that something goes wrong either there is a loss it doesn't have to enter the building it's just flying outside it flies outside the office mm -hmm. or in the compound mm -hmm. you know uh so every time it does that there's a strange things that are happening losses maybe a file is a file an important file goes missing uh, maybe this person is working on a project and somehow things just be, begin to work against the person that they are they are sending witchcraft for mm -hmm. so when that happens on the fourth day and the person gets fired the pigeon goes back to my grandmother and then it would uh take back the charm to show that it worked if the pigeon does not go back then my mother my my grandmother would know that uh the witchcraft did not work maybe this person is also consulting a higher power so she would send a stronger uh charm, charm. yes yeah so she would do things like that Owls, owls normally when she wanted somebody to die and she would give it a, a period of three months because she doesn't want anybody pointing fingers at her so what they do they they always want to pretend like they are good people you know those sorcerers because they know nobody can stand their evil if people find out that this person is killing or is killing our members this person is a sorcerer people will gather mm -hmm. so what happens is the first time she sends the all the person begins to get sicknesses but they are mild then the all goes back again to follow up the matter and and when what happens it goes at a certain time and it gives a sound at that specific time and it is consistent until the mission is accomplished and whenever this victim hears the sound of that oh it's like it's sending a spell of death so the situation worsens and the person does not realize if christians don't know spiritual things then they they are so lazy to pray Mm -hmm. and to engage in spiritual warfare. Jesus said men ought always to pray yes. and not to faint. Yeah, so we should not even faint. You see that all oh, don't faint. You just have to engage in spiritual warfare. So now she would do that. Then now when the person that is supposed to die is now in a critical condition, regardless of the hospital they have taken that person, they all will find itself there. And then normally they always wanted to work at the midnight hour. That's why around midnight, coming up to around four in the morning is when many patients die. Many people die at that time because the 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 sorcerers work so much at that time. Between 12 a.m. and 4 a.m. Yes, yes, in hospitals. So if you are an intercessor and God has led you to pray for patients, that is the time to pray for them because it's that time when the enemy is at work. The angel of death is coming to collect people normally at that time because uh, that's when they are very active and that's when they know that many prayerful people, intercessors are sleeping. People are relaxed. In fact, a person can be okay during daytime, then the situation worsens in the night, then by morning they're telling you that the person is no more. Yeah, so uh, it's during that time that uh, the owl would start producing the sound and even you hear strange cats in the hospitals you see strange cats you see birds things that you cannot even explain and then you all of a sudden register death in hospital so uh, my grandmother was working like that but using the sun and the moon to program people's lives that's why sometimes when we are reading the bible we we may not understand when the bible says we are blessed coming in blessed going out blessed in the city blessed 
blessed in the field. You have to declare the word of God upon your life because there is somebody who wakes up very early in the morning, as early as four, like my grandmother, to declare curses and spells upon the children of God. So even you, it's your right as a child of God to declare the word of God upon yourself. You say, I am blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed in the, in the, in the city, blessed in the field. You know, you, you just start declaring because what, what you're doing is you're undoing what the enemy is trying to do to you. Imagine somebody uh, programming the sun to feed on your sweat. That is so terrible. And we see it even happening to, to countries. We see it happening uh, to different people in different organizations. Uh, see, some countries have gold, they have all the minerals, but there is nothing to show for that. It's the other countries that are benefiting from it's all like, their resources. It's like the situation between Niger and France. Yes. Actually, all the Francophone countries, so-called so -called Francophone countries, all the countries in Africa that have profound amount of wealth. Mm -hmm. But there are certain European countries or certain Western countries that are plundering all of that wealth and keeping that nation destabilized so that they can plunder it yeah and though and that is the that is the fingerprint of witchcraft that's no wonder these western nations are so big on freemasonry yes because it makes them wealthy at the expense at the expense of these poor ignorant souls and a lot of those francophone countries they're muslim they're deep in islam in fact, so what power do they have to defend themselves? There's nothing. <laughs> There's nothing. But if we can only get the fact that we have power, God has given us power. But the Bible says we perish due to lack of knowledge. Due to lack of knowledge. Well, once we know these things that we are ex exposing, once we know the secrets of the enemy, and once we know the word of God, then there's no way the enemy is going to have access to your life. You will know when the devil is speaking, and you know when God is also speaking. You'll be able to differentiate the voices. You, if you know how the system is operating, the systems of the world are operating, then you have nothing nothing to fear because greater is he that is in us than the devil that is in the world. Now, um, I'll give an example. Witchcraft is so, so bad. Uh, our village is not a, a rich village. As, as in you see, God is just beginning to deliver the village. Yeah, because people have, have decided now to, to turn to God. They, are, they have given their lives to God. So now at least you can see some development happening in that village. But a person could, at the time I was with my grandmother, you see a situation where somebody has planted maybe cabbage on three acres of land. And the person has put in there everything. They have even gone to get a loan in the bank so that they can put something, you know, uh, do something for themselves. Then a person uh, plants cabbage on three acres. Probably even the land is rented. Then there's these night runners or the night dancers. <laughs> They call them night dancers. Yeah, they, they, a person just looks at the garden and he becomes jealous of this person. And then they go and in the night and they pull on one, on one cabbage. And then as a result, they have put a spell on the garden. And then there are maggots in all the plants, in all the cabbage. And this person gets a loss. A total loss. A total loss. You cannot sell cabbage that has maggots. If it's a tomato uh, farm, they still do the same. That's why you see in other places, when this kind of people are caught, they are killed. Yeah. Because people, this is someone's sweat. Somebody has gone to an extent of getting a loan to get out of that situation. And then the system of Pharaoh comes in. Pharaoh does not want to see the children of God happy. He just wants to keep them bound in slavery. And wherever you see witchcraft, you will see poverty. You will see suffering. You will see people, uh, sl uh, people having bed bugs, people having lice. You see people having um, jiggers. Oh, it's, it's, and, it's, and it's not just Africa. It's all over the world. In America, you'll see people, you know, you'll see 
violence in communities in certain neighborhoods in certain yes. cities you'll see the murder rate skyrocketing you'll see tornadoes coming in and destroying people's homes and communities you'll see uh, a, a surge in drug abuse and people doing getting high and 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 man people walking around like zombies you'll see you see people gunning each other down like crazy and they go for the best mm -hmm. they don't just kill anybody they kill the cream they kill that person that they see this person has a bright future this person is uh, capable of delivering the family members that's why even the pharaoh system he was going for the boys he hated the boys because the boys can fight to liberate their family so he was afraid of of the numbers of boys increasing boys means men and an army a few women have joined the army but many men join the armies and defend their countries so uh, like you see which country was this where they were not even allowing men to get out of the country but women and children were oh yeah that's ukraine ukraine yeah they were allowing the women and the children to get out but all the men it was a, a rule that every man has to stay back and fight so pharaoh hates anybody that that has anybody that has the capability of 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 delivering god's children of liberating god's children and i believe that's why the devil hates me so so much so much to a point that he cannot hide you know so i believe even you who is watching maybe this is answering your question maybe you're being fought because of the ministry and the mission that you have the assignment that god has placed on your life maybe the enemy sees that you'll be the one to construct the roads in your city and maybe the politicians have failed and they have kept people in that situation and there are so many accidents because of corruption and maybe god sees that you'll be the one to construct those roads you know so the enemy is fighting he does not go for useless people. He doesn't want to see anybody progressing. Yes. If it's not somebody who has sold their soul to him and is ready to offer is, and is offering sacrifices, blood sacrifices, he doesn't want to see anybody outside of him progressing because he knows if you progress in God, other people will start to look at you. They'll start seeing your progress and your they life will... Like you. Yes, and your life becomes a testimony and they oh and the people want that you know and so they want to be set free they want to come out from bondage they're asking how did you come out from bondage and that when they see it that it's god that jesus did it and they begin to ask about your lifestyle that's how you can set a lot of people free your life can set a lot of people free hmm. and the system has been designed to keep the few people rich at the expense of the majority and that was what was happening in our village my grandmother appeared to be doing much better than the majority and anybody who tried to rise up would be put down that's what we see get money today in your account a lot of money and you see the bank trying to to, to freeze your account how did you get rich it's a crime for you to just get rich all of a sudden maybe you had a million and then uh, all of a sudden 20 million is reflected in your account they will start investigating you they will start questioning you and holding your money like you're not allowed to become rich that's the system the system has been designed to keep majority down at the expense of the minority so I know at the expense of the majority yes the, minor the minority. minority the few are rich at at, at the, the expense, expense of the of the masses yes so this person is corrupt he has stolen uh, money that is supposed to take care of the of the sick or of the pregnant women or maybe people with uh, sicknesses and then the person is left to to enjoy and then you you work so hard and then god blesses you and then they start squeezing you and asking you and investigating you and making it difficult for you to access your resources because that's how the system has been designed and then even when you say that let me join politics and be able to defend my people and to do the right thing the person who's trying to do the right thing will be the person to be taken out because you're 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 hindering people from getting uh money that that is illegal because they want to do the wrong thing and and you you want to do the right thing so the system will, will automatically vomit you so now <laughs> saints 
if we know how the enemy functions and we know how God wants us to 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 like live as children of God then we have no reason one to fear the enemy we should not even be afraid of him and then secondly we have to live by the principles of God everything that he states for us to do in his word we have to live and abide by by, by it and and also we have to be strong we don't have to fear as as the children of God. Many people, when they hear my testimony, they some of them come to me and they say, "You see, Erica, I had your testimony. I can ad I must admit I was scared." You have no reason to fear the enemy, because the fact that I can sit here today and expose him and nothing happens to me shows that our God is powerful. Our God is all knowing. He's Almighty, and there's nothing that the enemy can do, because. I can I can guarantee you that Satan does not even want me to be alive today because of the information that is coming out. But I uh, I feel like we need to explain uh, more about the Egyptian gods and how they operate so that people can understand the system that we are in. Amen. And I think it's very telling that your grandmother would go during around 4 a.m. Yes. And get and begin to enchant and do rituals just when the sun is rising. Yes. In other words, at in early in the morning. Yeah. In the twilight. Yes. Just when the sun is coming up, those initial rays of the sun. Mm. And it's very telling because even Jesus would wake up and the Bible says before the sunrise. Yes. And he would go to an isolated place. And the Bible says, and there he prayed. Yes. And then that day you would see all kinds of miracles taking place. Amazing things happening. But it was normal for him. It was just standard operating procedure for him to wake up a great deal before sunlight. Yes. And, and undo what the enemy is doing. And undo it. You know, and, and so, you know, people will wake up and just go straight to work or just get up and go straight for the hunt or look for it, looking for a job or looking for this, that, and the other. Forgetting and for, that Adronia has already programmed. And there are many Adronias out there who are still alive right now, and that's what they're doing. And, and their family members, people that are close to us in most cases. And it's not just Africa. It's in the Western world too, as we're about to see. So, um... This is the gods of Egypt, and I think um, it's very important that we learn about them. Yes. Uh, this is not designed to put fear in anybody. Nobody should be afraid. We've already we've done a lot of exposing, and we're here. We're fine. We're, we thank God that the Lord has preserved us, and will continue to do so. So, the children of Israel came to Egypt during the time when a certain pharaoh by the name of Sesostris, the first or the second, was pharaoh of Egypt. He's famous because he appointed Joseph to be his second in command over all of the land of Egypt. Joseph came straight from prison to a position which is similar to that of a modern day prime minister. But after the reign of Sesostris the first came another pharaoh by the name of Ramses. This pharaoh did not know Joseph and was afraid of the population growth of the children of Israel. So Ramses made them his slaves. And throughout the reign of Ramses II, there was a great emphasis on religion as to have what is called Mat, M-A-A-T. Mat is a, supposedly a good relationship between the gods and the pharaoh, and it was essential for them. You're talking about population growth. It reminds me of Bill and Melinda Gates. They're yes. also afraid of population growth. Yes, you see them saying statements. You saw Bill... You know, I think it was at a TED Talks and he says, um, you know, the, the, the population is going up to about 8 billion. But with, you know, proper uh, fine, uh, family planning and vaccines, we can bring that down to about a certain number that was below 8 billion. So it's like the same right, system, the same system in, of, of, of population reduction. All right, so, you know, because God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue, have dominion. He didn't say multiply up to a certain number. He said, multiply, go ahead, have, you know, in a family, in a, in, in, under the institution of marriage, have a family, you know, yes. and, and, and grow your family. He didn't say stop at a certain number. 
God is able to supply. There's more than enough. But these people want to make it seem as if there's scarcity. Yeah, and if you And if you believe there is serious scarcity, that will become your experience. Yes. Um, so Jesus, I remember Jesus saying, be it unto you even as you believe. And, that, and, and people, sometimes they don't realize it, but your experience in this life is part and parcel of your belief system. So um, this Pharaoh and every Pharaoh wanted to achieve what is called mat or a good relationship between the gods and Pharaoh. And for them, this thing was essential. So numerous gods were worshipped, mainly including a god by the name of Ra Harakti or Amen-Ra or Ptah. According to one text, Ptah was the father of Atum, who later became the sun god Ra. And you'll see through these storylines of Egyptian mythology, this was their education. For in Egypt, this was the way we learn about Jesus, the way we learn about, about the Old Testament and the New Testament and about Elijah and all of these. That's how they learn about these gods. So the Egyptian civilization was all about the worship of these gods and the servicing of these gods. And, and you're going to see that as, as, time pro, uh, as we proceed. So Ramses and his chief wife, Nefertari, were also worshipped, you know. Um, that means that Pharaoh and his wife were also worshipped. They, they were like the embodiment of the gods, all right. So though Ramses worshipped many gods, a significant amount of tribute was given to Amun, the god of Thebes. And we'll just show you different pictures of these the various different gods. These are ain't this is ancient Egypt, all right? But you're gonna see how a lot of this stuff affects us today, affects society, civilization today is affected by this stuff that started way back then. That's why it's so important to study history. The, the ancient Egyptians were polytheistic, believing in more than one god, and are thought to have had thousands of gods and goddesses. They dictated how people lived their lives, how they treated other people, how they farmed and worked, and all their beliefs about the afterlife. The study of the gods of Egypt is crucial because it gives us an understanding of where we come from, the religion that formed the belief system of Babylon, Greece, and Rome, and how that belief system carries on today under different names. In the Bible, the Bible says, Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, the thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. So people think that ancient Egypt is long gone. And now this is 2023, 2024, 2025, etc., etc., 2030, etc. But if they study, they'll find out that, hey, what that has been is that which is. Still under the sun, people should know why it's important to pray before you start your day. Because uh, as I explained, there are people like my grandmother who, who are assigned to program people's lives. Imagine she's reading somebody's name and programming that person uh, through the sun to suffer. Every time the sun is out, the person is suffering. And also it makes this scripture uh, clear to me where it says he'll blot out every bad handwriting that has been written against us because there are people who have written and and and, and decided to program our lives colossians 2 14 blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us that was running counter to us yes. what is that handwriting it is the programming yes. that your life should suffer continuous various forms of misfortune and limitation and stagnation mm -hmm. people yes. suffer people, people reach out you know i get many messages i'm sorry i'm not even able to to reply all the messages on whatsapp but person tells you i have tried everything erica nothing is happening for me you know i've done everything that all my age mates have done i even have i have a master's degree but i have nothing life is not making sense you know stand on that scripture oh my god yes you see because life is spiritual it goes beyond your uh, academic education you know that's just one part of it but the other part must be added, which is the laws that govern life, that laws that govern the spirit realm. And they are found within the word of God. Now, because of the life-giving qualities of the sun, the Egyptians worshipped the sun as a god. And this is why Paul took issue with the ancient, with the Romans of his day. He said, because you are worshipping the created 
instead of the creator. Yes. So the Egyptians worshipped the sun as a god, the creator of the universe and the giver of life. The sun or Re or Ra represented life, warmth and growth to the ancient Egyptians. So as far as they were concerned, when they saw the sun, they were looking at God. They were looking at the sun god Ra. All right. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16, you'll see that this same type of worship had infiltrated into the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's why God would take issue with the children of Israel. They would repent. They would turn away from their sin. Then after some time, they would be influenced by the surrounding nations. They would go back into sin and then they would go into bondage because it's not God putting them in bondage. As soon as you begin to worship other gods, you're covenanting yourself to gods that will enslave you. True. All right. So in Ezekiel 8, 8, 8, 16, it says, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about five and 20 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east and they worshiped the sun toward the east. That's, that, that, is, that is the Egyptian sun worship of Ra, of Osiris, and etc. We'll get to that. We still see it even today in, in some religions. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So this brings us to the crux of our study, which is the gods of Egypt. The name Egypt through the lineage comes through the lineage of, of Noah. The ancient Egyptians were descended from Ham through the line of Misraim. Ham had four sons, remember? Cush, Misraim, Put, and Canaan. And that's in Genesis chapter 10, verse 6. So the name Misraim is the original name given for Egypt in the Hebrew Old Testament. So the name means house of bondage but could also mean house of refuge and protection. This is because Egypt was a place of refuge for Abraham and Jacob and the 70 Hebrew souls that that left Canaan and entered into Egypt during the time of great famine. Remember, they left Canaan and they went to Egypt for, for food and, and Joseph was the uh, prime minister at the time. So Egypt, in one way, it was a house of refuge, but in another way, it's also a house of bondage. But it was also a house of bondage during the time of slavery for the Hebrew children of Israel. Now, the Ennead or the great Ennead was a group of nine deities. Ennead is a group of nine. The word Ennead, E-N-N-E-A-D, Ennead is a group of nine. So the great Ennead of Egypt is the group of nine gods that they worshipped. So this is this Ennead is a group of nine deities or gods in Egyptian mythology that were worshipped at a place called Heliopolis. You remember Heliopolis? We mentioned that when we were exposing Onstar, the North Star, yes, Sirius, the god Sirius, which yes. is Lucifer. Yeah. Yes. So they yeah. worshipped at Heliopolis. Heliopolis is also known as the city of the sun. Heliopolis is a city in Egypt. The sun god, Atum, his children, Shu and Tefnut, and their children, Geb, Earth, and Nut, Sky, and their children, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. So there's nine, there's nine of these gods. The sun god, Atum, his children, Shu and Tefnut, their children, Geb, and Nut, and their children, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. You see, there's nine of them. All right, so the Ennead, that's the Ennead, the group of these nine gods, sometimes includes Horus, the elder, which is Horus. seen here. I've seen many celebrities uh, parading the eye of Horus. Yes, yes, yes. yes. You're oh going to see God. that. Taylor you're gonna, Swift. Mm -hmm. You're yeah, going to see that. You're going to see that in this as we study this. So, um, and here's a picture of Horus. You can see him uh, guiding a certain lady here. And this is how Horus looks. You see that he wears a crown. There's there's two ostrich feathers on his head. He's holding um, uh, an ankh, which is supposedly the 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 cross or the 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 the, the tree of uh, life or the or eternal the symbol for eternal life, and etc. And you can see the different forms of this uh, of these gods. So, uh, and of, of Horus. So an ancient form of the falcon god, not the son of Osiris and Isis. So Horus, the elder is a different, is a different God, but these are just different. As we, as we proceed, you'll see that these are just different forms of, of Satan. Yeah. So, um, that makes exactly 10 gods of the ancient Egyptian Ennead. 
Of course, the Egyptian pantheon of gods is greater in number than just 10, but these are the gods referred to as the Ennead. You can see 10 of them sitting there. One, Atam, or Atem, or Tem, or Ra, or Re, the sun god Atam, or Re, or Ra, in ancient Egyptian religion, one of the manifestations of the sun and creator god, according to the Egyptians perhaps originally a local deity of Heliopolis, city of the sun. Atom's myth merged with that of the great sun god, Ra, giving rise to the deity, Re Atom. Among all gods, Atom really is of great importance, and some would say he is the most important of all. The first creation god, as explained by every scholar, Atom is said to have ascended from chaos waters with the appearance, get this, of a snake. Also, it is, says that, it is said that Atom was the first being to emerge from the darkness and endless watery abyss that existed before creation. Darkness and abyss would be very appropriate talking about the watery depth where Atom is coming from. So let's get a little bit of Bible context in there. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So it is God who created the heavens and the earth, not Atom, not the sun god Ra or Re. And if you see Re saying that he presents himself as a serpent that came from the depths of the waters, what you know uh, before creation or before recreation? Um, I guess that that's definitely Satan. Yes. So if Adam is claiming that he ascended from chaos waters with the appearance of a snake, then we can logically deduce that Adam is actually Satan in one of his many forms. It also explains why David said that from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Yeah. So, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So we know that the serpent is Satan. Mm -hmm. All right. The word of God first introduces Satan as a serpent. Satan, which means adversary, chose to enter into the body of the serpent so as to approach Eve and deceive her. So you can see a picture of this god Atum or the sun god Ra or Re. Some people pronounce it Re. The second one in the Egyptian Ennead pantheon of gods is Shu, god of air and wind, peace and lions. Shu, uh, uh, in, he's the Egyptian god of emptiness or he who rises up, so they say. My grandmother used to send bad wind to people to like they call in, in our language they say empel so she would send bad wind to people to let's say a person gets an accident you know a person gets misfortune because she has sent bad wind so it's like a spell that would be carried by the wind to, to bring this fortune. It's the same spell that is being sent everywhere for everybody to begin to suffocate all of a sudden and then they brand it with a name and then they force everybody to go on a lockdown. Yeah, oh it's, the, the same, it's the same, right? It's like this this very same shoe, God of air and wind. Hmm. How do you think COVID-19 is carried? Mm -hmm. Through the air and through the wind. That's why people are forced to put on masks. Yes. Okay. So... Um, he was the primordial or original one of the Egyptian gods and spouse and brother to the goddess Tefnut. See, you see, these gods now are brother and sister, but they marry and they have children. Incest. Yeah, that's Same why. Something that happened to my grandmother. Yeah, the, right. Adronia would, con she would commit incest. With her brother. Yeah. With her same, same dad, same mom. Imagine that. No wonder, because the God, the, the the various spirits that would enter into them are husband and wife, and they insist on on incest. incest. So, was one of the prime original Egyptian gods, spouse brother to the goddess Tefnut, and one of the nine deities of the Ennead of the Heliopolis cosmogony. He was the god of peace, lions, air, and wind. Right, so you can see him here. You can see that. Um, 
he wears uh, this f ostrich feather representing the air in his in his head on his head you can see him holding the ankh and uh yeah he's holding a, a what is called a waz in his other hand a waz is a symbol of dominion and power it has the head shape at the front like some kind of an animal but at the very bottom of that of that waz of that stick there's like a small fork you can see it there so let's get this in Bible, in biblical context, because we don't want people to believe that um, Mr. Shu is is a, a deity that created the heavens and the earth. Bible says, "For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is, is given, given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful." Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So it is Jesus who is the Prince of Peace, not Shu. According to God's word, Jesus is the only God of peace. If they say that Shu was the God of wind, then we we can combat that with Mark chapter 4, verse 39. The Bible says when Jesus was in the boat and the and the and the waters were going crazy and the winds were were going crazy. The Bible says he accidents. He'll send winds for accidents. Yes. And, now, <laughs> and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Who had sent that wind? It was Shu. I, I, or some witch like Adronia mm -hmm. had sent the bad winds. Yes. Oh my God. So clearly Jesus is far greater than Shu. But let's take a look at the next Egyptian god. Number three is the sister of Shu, and also wife, Tefnut, or Tefanet. You can see her here. Uh, she's the daughter of Atom Ra, or that the 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 sun god Ra or Re, and goddess of moisture, water, rainfall, and fertility. Twin sister and female counterpart of the air god Shu. Water, rainfall, and fertility. Mm -hmm. Wow. And when you see them saying, you know, uh, moisture, water, rainfall. In other words, as far as the Egyptians were concerned, everything in life had a god behind it or a goddess. So if something was missing and they needed something, they would consult this goddess so that this thing can be provided. Yeah, it's making sense. Cause and that goddess must be serviced yeah, with offerings. For me, it's making sense because I'm still remembering my grandmother holding the reins. Mm -hmm. and, and, and causing the rains to only fall in her farm and other people are not receiving the rains but she's consulting with her gods she also had gods for everything so for me it's just it's just making everything clear yes so as you can see her symbol seems to be her, her appearance is the face of a lion but the body of a woman and on her head you can see the sun disk and the serpent wrapped around the sun disk, and there's two serpents on either side of that sun disk. Hmm. That's, Wait, mm -hmm. two heads of the serpent, or, or two mm -hmm. heads of a serpent on one serpent, on the hard two, disk. Two, yeah, there's two, it's two, uh, so two serpents. Two serpents. Okay. And they're <laughs> cobras. Wow. Like. And she's <laughs> holding an ankh, Ooh. and she's holding a scepter. Remember, I told you about that snake that she would consult for the reins. Mm. And you asked me about the heads, and I told you they were cobra heads. Yes, Hi. yes. I remember that. So they say that Tefnut is a goddess of rain. But wait a minute. In James chapter 5, verse 17, James uh, reminds us that Elijah or Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. That's James chapter 5, verse 17. So uh, clearly, Tefnut could not bring the rains when God's answered. Uh, when God decided to hold the rain as a result of Elijah's prayer, yeah. even Tefnut could not bring them back. So if the Egyptians trusted Tefnut for fertility, then they have never heard about how Hannah prayed and God heard her prayer and opened her womb and she had a son. Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says, Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. So it is the Lord who opens the womb. 
If you go to the enemy to open your womb, <laughs> he takes from one side and gives you another problem for on the other. So the baby that's supposed to bring joy instead brings pain and heartache trouble and, and pain. Yeah, wow. People have devilish kids, they end up in prison. People have demonic sometimes demonic children, children. end up killing their children, their parents or their children. Yeah, because of wealth, you know, or their uh, brothers and sisters or uh, members of society. Imagine raising a child only for your child to become your enemy. So, according to ancient Egyptian mythology, Shu and Tefnut were the first divine pair and they began to procreate. And their union brought another god, another Egyptian god, according to ancient Egyptian mythology by the name of Gab. Geb or Gab, father of snakes. <laughs> these, are, these, are, these just look like different forms of Satan. He was believed to be the deity of earth, the ground the soil, the earth, and was central to the ancient Egyptian creation myth. In fact, the ancient Egyptians referred to earth as the house of Geb. According to the ancient Egyptians, Geb was the grandson of Ra, the sun god, and the son of Shu and Tefnut, the deities of air and moisture, respectively. You see, to the ancient Egyptian mind, everything had a different god, and that was directly responsible for its creation, protection, and maintenance. This kept the Egyptians in continuous service for the continuation of the said provisions. If Gab is the father of serpents, then the word of God can tell us who this father of serpents is. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 14, the Bible says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust yes. shall you eat all the days of your life. So that's the, that's the serpent for you. That's Satan. The serpent is Satan and he is a cursed being. He is cursed. And when the serpent was also working in my life, I remember I ate soil. Mm -hmm. I ate dust. Mm -hmm. My grandmother used to eat soil. Mm -hmm. I, I fed on, uh, on filth, charcoal, uh, chalk, soap. Oh my God, that curse is so bad. Hey, hey. So the serpent is Satan. He is a cursed being. God did not curse Adam, but he did curse Satan. Mm. So to even deal with Satan, you have to enter into a covenant, covenant with that curse. That's why Satan wants you to fornicate. That's why he needs you to sin, to adulterate, to, to enter into covenants with him through eating, through different ways so that he can have access to your life because he's a cursed being. And in order to spread the curse, he must be in covenant with whatever he's spreading that curse to or whoever. So this means that his domain is in the realm of the accursed. Gab is just another name for the same accursed serpent who has, crea who has created a web of lies using a story of various gods with which he can deceive people and lead them away from God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, the Bible says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So Satan is a transformer. Which is interesting because there's a Transformer movie series yes. in Hollywood, Transformers. Yes. That's the various gods transform. They turn into other things. So, so parents, be mindful of what you're allowing your children to watch. Amen. Amen. Satan can transform himself into many different appearances and beings. This will make more sense later. But for now, let's continue in the next, uh, with the next ancient god. As you can see, this uh, ancient god... His symbol was barley, goose, a bull, a viper. All right, let's go on to Nut or Nuit or Newt. Is oh, her name is pronounced Newt. She was the Egyptian sky goddess, born of Shu, god of air, and Tefnut, goddess of water. So Shu and Tefnut got together and they had a child called Newt. So uh, uh, her brother and husband, Geb, the earth she bore, uh, yeah, her husband was called Geb the Earth. He, he's Geb was the god of the earth, remember? Mm -hmm. So with her husband, she bore Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. So you see that it started with one and then two come together, brother and sister come together, they have two more. There's those two brother and sisters get together and they, and they have more. So you see where this incest is coming from. There's a lot of incest. So Newt, also known by various other transcriptions, is the goddess of the skies, stars, cosmos, 
mothers, astronomy, and the universe in the ancient Egyptian religion. She was seen as a star-covered nude woman arcing over the entire earth, or as a cow. She was depicted wearing the water pot sign that signifies her. That signifies her. So you can see her symbol here. You can see how the ancient Egyptians had drawn Newt as the sky goddess and she was covering the whole earth as if she was the firmament. <laughs> yeah. So she said, so according to the ancient Egyptians, these gods are the ones that formed the earth. You can see how according to ancient Egyptian mythology, the goddess Newt was the one who created the heavens. All right. So for biblical context, the Egyptian goddess Newt did not create the heavens. God did. Psalms 33 verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalms 33 verse 6. Now, Gab and Newt, the second divine pair, then had four children according to Egyptian mythology. These children are Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Nephthys. So let's start with Osiris. According to ancient Egyptian lore, Osiris is the god of fertility, agriculture, the afterlife, the dead, resurrection, life, and vegetation in ancient Egyptian religion. He was classified, he was classically depicted as a green-skinned deity with a pharaoh's beard, partially mummy-wrapped at the legs, wearing a distinctive atef crown, and holding a symbolic crook and flail. I'll explain what the crook and the flail is. He was one of the first to be associated with the mummy wrap. You see how they wrap mummies? Or oh, the, the, the pharaohs, they would wrap him. After they die, they would wrap them up. He was the first to be associated with that mummy wrap. Now, according to Egyptian mythology, when his brother Set cut him into pieces after killing him, Osiris' wife, Isis, found all the pieces and wrapped his body up, enabling him to supposedly return to life. And people, people actually believed that stuff. You know, they believe, they really believed it. You know, there are some traditions where if a, a man dies, they, they perform a ritual on the widow. The widow has to sleep with the dead body of the man, uh, bidding him farewell. You know, oh, the, that's I think disgusting. It's, it's witchcraft. It's the same thing that we're seeing here. So Osiris was widely worshipped until the decline of ancient Egyptian religion during the rise of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Osiris was the judge and lord of the dead and the underworld, the lord of silence, and Kenti Amentiu, meaning foremost of the Westerners. As you can see, here he is, and uh, you can see that he's holding uh, the flail. He's holding, he's holding uh, a, a crook and flail they were symbolic the flail was a tool that was used as you can see him holding it here it is a tool that is used for threshing wheat and so it's a farmer's tool it is used for harvesting wheat and then the flail is is the is a tool that shepherds use to guide sheep so symbolically pharaoh would hold the crook and the flail and they would represent He's the provider and he is the guide of the people and the nation. So they were symbolically um, symbols of authority and dominion. Yeah. So you can see him. You can see him here holding the crook and the flail with his arms crossed. You see where that comes from? You see, that's where they got it from. Here he is wearing his distinctive Atef crown. Um, so the crook and flail held by the Osiris by Osiris in a cross-armed pose made famous by Chadwick Boseman in the movie Black Panther represents the harvester's tool, the threshing of wheat, and the shepherd's crook used by the shepherd for guiding sheep. They are a symbol of Pharaoh's supreme authority over Egypt as the people's divine leader and provider. Can you see Chadwick Boseman here posing like Osiris? You would think that ancient Egypt is ancient. You would think that that's out of style, like they're not doing that anymore. But look, this is exactly what they're doing. The system that is controlling this world. Here's, here's Chadwick Boseman again, Mr. Wakanda Forever. Here he is posing at the Oscars. In other words, he's saying that this God forever. Yeah, that's, that's whom they worship. That's whom they are worshiping. That's who Hollywood worships. 
the Black Panther Egyptian god Osiris pose. This is that cross-armed pose. Then Christians have to denounce that word. If you've said it Wakanda forever, you, <laughs> you have to denounce it because, hey. So Chadwick Boseman died at age 43 after battling colon cancer. You can understand how that comes, knowing that the, the initiation also, amongst them uh, is sodomy. sodomy. Is sodomy, yeah. So it was only a matter of time. You know, Satan, just, he can give you some shine. He can give you some stardom for a short time. But after that, it's time to collect. And he came and collected. Satan can never give you stardom for free. One of the movies uh, Chadwick Boseman acted in was uh, August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. A film where Chadwick Boseman blatantly blas he blasphemed the Lord Jesus for no reason. I would not advise you to see that movie, but it was just a blasphemy and it was just ridiculous for nothing. This made him a favorite, though, in Hollywood. Since the more you blaspheme God, the more favored you are by the kingdom of darkness and the more famous you seem to become. Osiris then married his sister Isis, of course, incest, and the two then ruled over Egypt together. So they said that Osiris is the god of fertility, agriculture, the afterlife, the dead, resurrection, life, and vegetation. Seven things. But for biblical context, is Osiris the god of fertility? No. In Genesis 128, the Bible says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Question number two, is Osiris really the god of agriculture? No. How do we know that? Because the Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 11 to 12, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Well, is Osiris the god of the afterlife? Nope. nope. How do we know? Because the Bible says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That's Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. And to whom belongs judgment? Or who is the judge? John 5 verse 22 and 23 answers that. For the Father judges no man, this is Jesus speaking, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which has sent him. So any nation saying that they honor the Father or they honor the Torah or they honor this or they honor that, if they're not honoring Jesus, they're not honoring God. And don't let anybody tell you any different because as soon as they say they're honoring the father, but they're not honoring Jesus, that is the spirit of Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Well, then is Osiris the God of the dead? Hold on. Let's see. Matthew chapter 22, verse 31 and 32. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, Jesus says, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. If death is separation from God, then yes, Osiris is the God, small g, of those that are separated from God, and he therefore rules over those who are spiritually dead. But in hell, it is the wrath of God that is poured out upon all of them. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24 through 28, Because I have called, God said, and you refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But you have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. When your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you, then shall they call me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they shall not find me. And why is he saying that? Because when he called, when he sent preachers, pastors, prophets, apostles, uh, etc they would not listen they would not turn from their sins okay so but is osiris the, res the resurrection and the life no way john eleven twenty five. 25 jesus says and jesus said unto her i am the resurrection and the life he that believes in me though he were dead yet shall he live 
Okay, so Jesus is the resurrection, but what about the life? John 14 verse 6, Jesus said that to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Well, o Osiris also said he's the God of vegetation. So is he? No way. Psalms 104 verse 14, speaking of God, he says, he waters the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. So what Adronia was doing, she was trying to undo what the word says. So if a Christian is being affected by a, a sorcerer like Adronia, they can stand on this scripture. Yes. Wow. They can stand on that word. In fact, they can declare that word over their farms, and they should be. In fact, repeat it so that this, uh, if somebody is watching and they are farmers and they are facing the same challenges, they can declare that word. Psalms 104 verse 14. Mm -hmm. He waters the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. Amen. That's the word of God. Declare that over your farms. So Osiris may very well be another incarnation of Satan or the angel of death. Either way, his domain is over the spiritually dead. So if you leave your body without Jesus, that God, Osiris or Satan or the angel of death has legal right to take hold of you. Number seven, Isis. According to Egyptian mythology, Isis was revered as the Egyptian goddess of love, healing, fertility, magic, and the moon, and held immense significance in ancient Egyptian religious beliefs. Known by various names, including Aset or Eset, she was the most worshipped deity throughout Egyptian culture, even during the Greek rule of ancient Egypt. Later, she played a role in Roman mythology, and the historians have even compared her to the Virgin Mary of Christianity, and this is because the Catholic Church simply kept worshipping their ancient gods and changed Isis' name to Mary. That's why they venerate, they continue to venerate Mary. They insist on the worship or the veneration or praying through or saying, Hail Mary, full of grace, and repeating over and over and over, asking for Mary to intercede on their behalf. Who is this Mary? That's none, none other than Isis. Because Mary passed away years ago and she's in heaven celebrating she finished her work she kept the faith so any attempt to communicate with somebody who is passed on necromancy. that's necromancy yeah and that's why the catholic church love that's why the vatican loves it because they it is the continuation the for them. Mm -hmm. it is the continuation of the ancient goddess worship of egypt supposedly the mother goddess is a virgin deity and miraculously gave birth to horus making her a mother goddess a major goddess in ancient Egyptian religion whose worship spread throughout the Greco-Roman world. Isis is first mentioned in the Old Kingdom around 2686 to 2181 BC as one of the main characters of the Osiris myth in which she resurrects her slain brother and husband, King Osiris, then produces and protects his heir, Horus. She was believed to help the dead enter the afterlife as she helped Osiris, and she was considered to be the divine mother of Pharaoh, who was likened to Horus. Her maternal aid was invoked for healing and for spells, enchantments, witchcraft, and rituals that would aid ordinary people. She was very prominent in funerary practices and magical texts. She was usually portrayed as a woman with a hieroglyph over her head in the shape of a throne or a sun disk. You can see how she looks here. That's how they drew her in ancient Egypt. Can you see Isis here also with the wings I've spread? I've seen many artists with those tattoos. Yes, Isis with the sun disc between the horns of a cow. You can see that sun disc, an yes. ode to Ra, the sun god, and then between the horns of a cow. During the New Kingdom, which was about 1550 to 1070 BC, as she took on traits that originally belonged to Hathor, the preeminent goddess of earlier times, Isis was portrayed wearing Hathor's headdress, which was a sun disc between the horns of a cow. You see the horns of the horns of the cow in a sun disc. So Isis was revered as the Egyptian goddess of love, healing, fertility, magic, and the moon. 
However, is Isis the God of love? No, she's not. First John chapter four, verse eight. He that loves not knows not God for God is love. Is Isis the God of healing? No. Nope. <laughs> Bible says, and Jesus went about Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had palsy and he healed them. Oh, those that were lunatic. In other words, when the moon, during the full moon, yes. they, they seemed to lose their minds. And then they throw themselves in hot water, in fire, in danger. Imagine, because it's a spirit, it's spiritual. They don't throw themselves on a soft uh, area, like maybe a mattress. You say somebody just fell on a mattress. They fall in dangerous places. Yes, there's this lady that we were helping in, and I believe it's in Bungoma, Busia, close to the border, this lady would get epileptic, epileptic seizures, and every time she gets a seizure, she's always falling. She has to fall on the flame. She has to fall if, if there's a if, if she's in the Maybe kitchen. Preparing porridge, she yeah, falls in the porridge. she has to fall into the porridge. I mean, she and fell so many, one. and she lost she lost her leg because of it, and she had been suffering. Actually, she her her leg was severely injured. She suffered for about seven years before. You know, we thank God we were able to um, get her uh, that get that leg amputated. She didn't have the money to get it amputated, so she was wallowing in such poverty, and that is witchcraft. That is very spiritual. So, um, is 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 Isis the goddess of fertility? No, fertility in the kingdom of darkness represents immorality, mm -hmm. procreating with someone who is not your spouse. That explains having sex under age. You have 12, 13, a 13 year old girl, 12 year old girl. She's pregnant, you know, then, of course, she's not ready to have a child. So she aborts. That's why so many of these young, these celebrity women are worshiping Isis. Rihanna, mm. that, that explains why her music is so seductive and it sends immoral messages. Yes. Oh. To make these young girls want to dress like her, act like her. And it transmits that spirit into them. So they become overly sexual and they're just 13, 14 years old. What's, what happens as a result? They get pregnant, but they're too young to raise the child. So what do they do? They have an abortion. And that's how Isis collects blood Even and flesh of children. When she was pregnant and she performed, she performed in a seductive way. Absolutely. Yeah. So... Ah, Genesis chapter 29, verse 31. That answers the question as, as to whether Isis is truly the God of procreation that makes it possible for people to procreate. She's not. God is. And the Bible says... She had to, to perform when she was pre mm -hmm. Oh, my God. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So you can see, yeah, she performed while she was pregnant. Why? Because she is giving... Uh, worship or paying homage to Isis, the goddess of supposedly fertility. Now, in Genesis chapter 30, we see God remembering Rachel and God hearkened to her and opened her womb and she conceived and bare a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So it is God who is able, fully able to open your womb and to give you a child within the context of marriage, of course. But is this Isis, the god of magic? Well, magic is witchcraft, divination, and sorcery. What does God say about that? Deuteronomy chapter 8 from verse 10 to verse 12. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that uses divination or an, or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God does drive them out from before thee. Amen. Is Isis the goddess of the moon? Hold on. Genesis chapter 1 verse 16 through 18. And God made true two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. 
and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. So God is the one who created the firmament, the dome, it's firm. It's, it's a firm dome that covers the earth, covers the whole earth and inside the firmament he has put the stars and he has put um, the sun which travels over the earth and the moon also. So, that's it with Isis. Let's move on to the next one. Number eight is Set or Seth. Seth is a god of deserts, storms, disorder, violence, and foreigners in ancient Egyptian religion. In ancient Greek, the, the god's name is given as Seth. His symbol was a scepter and his set animal. Uh, the was is a symbol of power and dominion, while the ankh is the Egyptian symbol of life and fertility, widely used by witches and New Age occultists, and is one of several symbols which form the insignia of the Theosophical Society. Can you see here the Theosophical Society symbol? And inside of the six-sided hexagram, which is 666, the geometric representation of 666 is that hexagram, which many mistakenly call the Star of David. That is not the Star of David. That is the hexagram, one of the most powerful symbols in in uh, in witchcraft. My grandmother was using to send spells. Mm. And you can see it is a star surrounded by a circle. That's the North Star. And who's the North Star? That's the Antichrist. And why are they worshiping fertility? Because Satan is going, is having a child. And who is that child? Horus. Who is that Horus? You are going to find out. So, also known as the Tower Cross or the Key to the Nile. In ancient Egyptian astronomy, Set was commonly associated with the planet Mercury. You can see set here with a head that's that's like some kind of a, a moose or yeah some kind of an animal um so is set a god of disorder violence and deserts first corinthians chapter 14 verse 33 the bible says for god is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all churches of the saints let's move on to number nine neftis or her name is also pronounced Nebet Het in ancient Egyptian. It was a goddess in ancient Egyptian religion. She is the Egyptian goddess of death and the night, goddess of the sky and patroness of the family, mourning, meaning weeping, rivers, protection, the dead, hearth, uh, the fireplace, hearth is a fireplace, uh, coffins, uh, burial, and air. A number of the great Ennead, a member of the great Ennead, which is the group of nine deities in Egyptian mythology, of Heliopolis in Egyptian religion. She was the daughter of Nut and Gab. Nephthys was typically paired with her sister Isis in funerary rites because of their role as protectors of the mummy and the god Osiris and the sister wife of Set. Nephthys was normally portrayed as a young woman wearing a headdress in the shape of a house and basket. You can see that the, her symbol is the sacred temple enclosure. You can see her on top of her head is, is a headdress of a, in the shape of a house, a very slim house, and then on top of it, there's a basket. It's, ex it's explaining exactly what we were talking about, how uh, people would die from the midnight hour coming to mourning because there are so much evil activities at that time and that's when the owls and all those evil birds and and evil animals are sent mm -hmm. you know to to come and collect for yes. the angel of death oh my oh, god and by the way this theosophical society with the hexagram and a serpent around that hexagram and then a swastika in inside of it huh. It's a, first, of, first of all, that's a serpent eating its tail, which is an Ouroboros, which is a symbol of what? Eternity. And then a hexagram inside of it. Um, this is the official religion of the United Nations. And the headquarters of the United Nations is in 666, I believe it's Park Avenue or 666 some avenue in New York City. 666. And, 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 and I mean, can it be any more obvious? So, yeah. So, moving right along, 
Mathis with this is her with the headdress shaped like a rectangular house with a basket on top of it. Can you see the different pictures of her? This is this is her ancient pictures. Looks like a just like an innocent doll or an innocent cartoon, but man, these the the people really worshiped these gods and goddesses and they they brought a lot of destruction on humanity. It is said that Isis and Osiris was killed by his brother Ses who, desiring the throne, dismembered his body and scattered the pieces throughout the land. Isis and Nephthys then gathered the pieces of Osiris' body, and with the help of the god Thoth and the funeral god Anubis, Isis was able to reconstruct Osiris, creating the first mummy. So Iris impregnated Isis after his resurrection, but was too weak to remain in the world, and so he died. Now, you see this whole the story of reincarnation yeah this the whole those whole storylines of idolatry they're explained in proverbs chapter 12 verse 6 the words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them in other words this whole entire storyline of the mythology and and idolatry and, and devil worship is to lie in wait for blood so Let's move on to Horus, the Egyptian god of kingship and war. Horus, in Egyptian, either might be pronounced Har or Her or Heru, in ancient Egyptian religion was a god in the form of a falcon whose right eye was the sun or morning star, representing power and quintessence, and whose left eye was the moon or evening star, representing healing. Osiris was the husband of his sister Isis, as usual, and the father of Horus, protector of the pharaohs of Egypt, one, son of Osiris and Isis, two, and Horus lost his eye in battle. That's a clue, because Zechariah chapter 11 verse 17 says, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaves the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Ah, can you see Isis sitting with her son Horus? Mm -hmm. Mother and child. Can you see her again? Isis sitting with her son Horus? That's mother and child, right? And, and, and again, wife to the son. Mm -hmm. And now here again is Isis and her son Horus, mother and child. But what is Horus holding? A globe. You see, it is very important and it is very central for the system of Antichrist for the world to believe that the earth is a globe. It is very important. The heliocentric model of earth is central to the deception that is coming upon the whole earth they must believe that the earth is a globe. Why? Because if they believe that the earth is a globe, they believe that there are other planets. And if they believe that there are other planets, there must be life on those planets. And if those, if that life or if those beings come to the earth with superior technology and begin providing solutions for mankind's problems, problems which they secretly caused in the first place, but if they come providing all of these solutions and start explaining how they created man, then humanity is going to believe them. And that is the strong delusion that 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is talking about. He says, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So it comes right back to the worship of Isis, Horus, and, and Osiris. Mother, you see here, Isis and Horus, mother and child. Isis and Horus again, mother and child. You see it again, Isis and Horus here. And what is he holding in his hand? A globe. So Isis and Horus and her son, uh, the son, which is the son of Satan, holding the heliocentric globe deception in his hands, deceiving the whole world. And Horus, for your information, is known as the solar god. And his symbol is the eye of Horus. And you can see him so here. With a f that eye. Yeah, but it's about to get deeper. Watch this. Horus can be seen here. Can you see that this is also his symbol? Mm -hmm. Falcon or an eagle yes. with uh, a crown, uh, uh, the the uh, sun disc over his head. We'll look at the same thing on the $1 bill. They're both looking at the same direction too. 
with the sun over his head and a hexagram inside. This is on the one dollar bill. It can't be any any clearer. Than it can't, this. Yeah, it doesn't get any clearer than this. So what are they worshiping in this economy? They are worshiping the sun god Horus. America is is an Egyptian system. Yes. Ah. Yes, the modern day U.S. of A. And not just America, the whole world. The U United Kingdom is the same thing. Uh, 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 the Vatican is the same thing. It is ancient Babylonian and Egyptian sun god worship. It explains why they are forcing African leaders to bow to their terms and conditions. Like if you don't support the LGBTQ, we are taking our funds, we are doing this. They put conditions just to control the whole world. Yes. Enslave everybody. Yes. And can you see how, um, like recently, when uh, Jill Biden, the wife of the US president, came to Kenya? It was at the exact time when a certain magistrate had signed off allowing homosexuals to form uh, non governmental organizations and receive an NGO license. That means that they can open a bank account and that means they can receive funding and that means they can spread their ideology all through the country. Now, uh, look. That explains why now all, most of the Kenyan celebrities are in dresses. A lot of them are still, and they're going the to continue. Mayor. They're going to continue wearing dresses unless they repent. And, if, and, and they're going to continue in homosexuality and get cancer of the colon and HIV and all manner of sickness and disease. And that represents the end of their bloodline. That's a strategy of population control. But also, it is the worship of Horus, the one-eyed symbolism. Because that one eye is also a symbol of sodomy. And it is all manner of abominations wrapped into one. But right there above Horus, you can see the this sun god Horus, the, the bird. You can see over it the sun disk. The this is the great seal of the United States. It is Horus with the sun disk over his head. The North Star, Sirius, the sun god Ra, the Antichrist hexagram, the 666 hexagram inside of the sun disk. And the Egyptian god of the sky, he is the Egyptian god of the sky, war and protection. Can you see in this symbol here that he's holding missiles or he's holding well, what looks like missiles they're actually arrows on one hand and then olive branch on the other so what does it mean <laughs> it means basically where horus if you know you're dealing with horus and he's holding weapons on one hand and an olive branch which represents peace on the other he's saying do as i say and there will be peace if not there will be no peace that's and the symbol and that of chaos. and that is the great seal of the united states can you see how ancient pagan uh, idol worship of the gods Ra and Horus and Osiris and Isis is going on right now? Many celebrities have taken photos when they are covering their right absolutely, eye. Absolutely, absolutely. You see, uh, and leaving you, their left eye open, they are uh, telling you, "Oh, oh my God!" Yeah. So. As a sky god, the eyes of Horus were steeped in so-called magic and power. His right eye is associated with the moon and his left with the sun. The eye of Horus appears frequently in Egyptian waterwork, uh, artwork, I mean, and on the United States $1 bill. Now, remember that eye. Let me repeat that scripture um, in, in Zechariah 11.17. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaves the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 17. So now you can see that this is the great deal, the great seal of the United States. <laughs> it's Horus with the sun disk over his head. Sun God worship, Ra. Later on, that name Ra was also known as Baal, Baal worship. I mean, this is deep because it's not a game. Ra, sun god, Baal, they demand sacrifice. Yeah. And they demand not small sacrifice, 
blood sacrifice and, and if babies. it is and children yes that's how baal is worshiped that's how the sun god is worshiped that's how horus is worshiped you cannot serve him without blood ritual no sacrifice and on so an industrial kids. scale there's so many children that go missing Mm -hmm. And then there, there, there are so many uh, clinics that are opening up for surrogate mothers where a person can even buy as many children as they can afford. And then those children, nobody knows what they are going to use those children for. There is human trafficking. The black market has increased. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah, so the eye of Horus appears frequently in Egyptian artwork and on the United States $1 bill. Now, if you can see that there's a hexagram above the head of Horus here and it's in the shape of a six-sided is a six-sided a hexagram has six points six triangles and is made up of six sides on its inner hexagon that is a geometric representation of 666 so when you see that they're preaching and they're saying that you know uh Christians must support the nation of Israel look at the the symbol on the flag of Israel. It's a hexagram. That hexagram is 666. It represents Horus. And that's why the Jews in Israel are waiting for their own Messiah. They're not waiting for Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. They did, They reject Jesus. They hate. If, in fact, if you preach Jesus, you might be arrested. They were trying to pass a law in Israel saying that a Christian attempting to proselytize or to convert others to Christianity can be arrested. Now, I don't know if the law, I don't think the law was passed, but they were, they had brought it up in the Knesset. The Knesset is their parliament or their Congress. They wanted to pass it as a law. And we saw how they were having homosexual parades in Israel, but homosexuality has not come, come up as something that can be banned in Israel. They haven't, they haven't submitted that as a, as a law. They haven't submitted the uh, petition to make homosexuality illegal in Israel. Can you imagine that? But they wanted to ban Christianity completely. So that, that should, that, that is very telling because Horus is a God of homosexuality. And the way that the 33rd degree served this God of homosexuality is through, uh, is through, uh, sodomy. You know what is coming in my mind before we even move? You see this same symbol? I explained about the throne of Saturn, about how he was on top of the pyramid and there was an eye giving light yes. to the rest of the of the people that were in that hall. And I explained how there was a, a, a carpet that, come, that came from the open mouth of a serpent that is like a tongue but going all the way down to in other words the pyramid was inside of the mouth of a of huge serpent, serpent whose mouth was wide open and yes. the serpent is a cobra yes and seated upon that uh pyramid was satan himself yes on top of the pyramid but beneath the throne was the tongue of the serpent coming out coming down the pyramid and yes and if you know the serpent is deceptive yes and his kingdom is built on, on lies even on lies. Say that you belong to your father satan when he speaks lies that is his language yes so when you're seeing this symbol on the one dollar bill you are looking at the eye of horus uh, and is very frequently used in Egyptian artwork and on the $1 bill. And on and a lot of other places, you'll see the Eye of Horus. Here's another depiction of that same Eye of Horus. Here's another depiction of the same Eye of Horus. So, in addition to his associations with the sky, Horus was seen as a deity of war and the hunt. That's why America will never stop being at war. They can't. They're serving Horus. And Horus demands bloodshed. He needs bloodshed. It's difficult for them to go into a country that is strong in Christianity because those, that country can pray. But if they're Muslim, oh, it's easy for Horus to go in there and just ransack. I mean, like Iraq. Over a million Iraqis died. Allah could not save because Allah does not save. And the so-called infidels were able to come in and take over. So, as a protector of the royal families, Horus, who claimed divine ancestry, he is associated with battles by kings to maintain the monarchy. The monarchy. So, inside the Egyptian coffins are ancient texts, which were funerary spells. There's those ancient uh, Egyptian coffins, there were texts inside. 
um, and they would communicate. Obviously, the Egyptian hieroglyphs was how they communicated with symbols. Coffin texts are a collection of ancient Egyptian funerary or funeral witchcraft spells written on coffins beginning in the first intermediate period, the dark years around 2181 to 2055 BC. They are partially derived from the earlier pyramid texts reserved for royal use only, but, but they contain substantial new material related to everyday desires, indicating a new target audience of common people. Ordinary Egyptians who could afford it had access to these funerary spells and the advantages of spell casting, which were usually exclusively for Egyptian royalty, and the temple priests were now accessible to ordinary Egyptians, meaning that when Pharaoh was going to be buried, there were texts that were spells that were uh, drawn or inscribed on the inside of his coffin. Those were spells. Those spells were to supposedly to guide him through the world of death. Those were witchcraft spells. Now they made those spells available to the ordinary Egyptian people. What they practiced in ancient Egypt was sorcery and witchcraft. And that sorcery and witchcraft made Egypt the, the super superpower that it was during their time. But of course, witchcraft doesn't, doesn't last. And now if you look at Egypt, it's in ruins. That ancient knowledge that was in Egypt passed on to Greece. Wow. Greece used the knowledge, became an empire, but then after a short time, Greece collapses. Where did it go from there? It went to Rome. That's where we are today, in the time of Rome's empire. And what is Rome practicing? The ancient god or goddess worship of the Egyptians. So, the collection of these coffin texts were assembled and called the Egyptian Book of the Dead. That's what is written in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The spells that were written to, to help them navigate death and, and, to, and all kinds of witchcraft spells. So some of the coffin texts came from Horus himself. The coffin texts describe Horus in his own words. Now watch this. Horus says something very key here. He says, no other god could do what I have done. I have brought the ways of eternity to the twilight of the morning. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. I have brought the ways of eternity to the twilight of the morning. I am unique in my flight. My wrath will be turned against the enemy of my father Osiris, and I will put him beneath my feet in my name of Red Cloak. Red Cloak. Wow. I've seen you see, Man. Uh, you've seen a lot of. There's a lot of uh, movies with with uh, uh, superheroes that are wearing red cloaks. In the movie Eyes Wide Shut, by the late Stanley Kubrick, and Stanley Kubrick was re responsible for a lot of the f the fake outer space, you know, um, footage of Lance Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Collins walking on the moon and uh, all of that f fake studio set of walking on the moon and and you know dressed up in in in, in like as if they're you know in, in space suits and they're supposedly jumping around on the moon and or whatever moon. yeah all of that stanley kubrick helped out helped out with that so he has another movie called eyes wide shut and this is what hollywood thinks of people thinks of the general public they look at people like a bunch of zombies walking with their eyes wide shut Jesus said they have eyes, but they don't see. They don't see. They so, have ears. But they cannot hear. In the movie Eyes Wide Shut by the late Stanley Kubrick, the character Red Cloak is the leader of the cult which Dr. William Hartford infiltrates. He was portrayed by the late Leon Vitali. Notice that everybody who acted in that movie, well, not, not everybody, but those That's two characters, they're dead. Interestingly, both are deceased. Those who serve Lucifer usually don't la live that long. So you can see him here in the red cloak. Can you see him? Real? This was the movie Eyes Wide Shut, where a doctor, you know, has a meeting and, and ends up finding himself uh, amongst the elite of the of the country. And look at what they're doing. They're con doing uh, occult um, seances and rituals. So this is an occult scene from Eyes Wide Shut. As you can see, the gown worn during the satanic ritual is a red cloak. A red cloak is a red cape, like Superman's. 
Here are some characters in movies that wear red cloaks. You can see Superman, Power Girl, Batwoman, Miss Fury, Thor. That's where we get the, day, the, the, the name of the day, Thor's Day or Thursday. Magneto, Scarlet Witch. I mean, they're straight up obvious Scarlet Witch. <laughs> and children are watching this. And yeah. Spawn, Simmons. That was his name, Simmons. And Doctor Strange. Check out Doctor Strange here coming through a portal on the cover artwork for the movie Doctor Strange. Of course, Doctor Strange is a sorcerer. Can you see him coming through the portal here? Can you see him wielding? Here is Doctor Strange wielding the solar energies of sorcery. Wearing a red cloak. So you see how Horus is going to... Let's go back. Let's, let's look at what Horus said. Because Horus dropped a major clue. When he said that, he says, no other God could do what I have done. He speaks in such pride. I have brought the ways of eternity to the twilight of the morning. You remember that Adronia used to go the during morning. the twilight of the, the morning, morning to do what? To, to cast to, spells and, and to program people's to lives. To program people's lives. So he says, no other God could do what I have done. I have brought the ways of eternity to the twilight of the morning. Now, if you don't know that about a drone, if you don't know that that people's lives can be programmed using the twilight rays of the sun early in the morning, you'd have no idea what this guy's talking about. He says, I have brought the ways of eternity to the twilight of the morning. I am unique in my flight. My wrath will be turned against the enemy of my father, Osiris, and I will put him beneath my feet. He's claiming that he's going to put Jesus beneath his feet. He's claiming he's going to put the body of Christ beneath his feet. The enemies of Osiris is the body of Christ and, and the Lord himself. He says, and I, I, he says, my wrath will be turned against the enemy of my father, Osiris, and I will put him beneath my feet in my name of red cloak. And you see the red cloaks, all of these. And now you can see Dr. Strange here. You can see him um, holding that red wearing a red cloak, wielding the powers of sorcery. Now, every pharaoh of Egypt claimed to be a direct descendant of Horus. Horus is the Antichrist who will fight against the enemy of his father, Osiris, who is Satan. And the enemy of Osiris is Jesus and by extension, the church. The coffin texts describe Horus in his own words. How he said no other God could do what I have done. Those were written. Those were inscribed inside of the coffin. It's one of the spells. All right. So, so this is also inside the Egyptian book of the dead. This is, this, this is from, this is from thousands of years ago. So I this still see it. and they're doing it right now. This is ongoing. This is part and parcel of the plan. So everything you're seeing in the world of entertainment, in movies, in series, in, in new pop stars coming up, holding all of them, holding, you know, some of them have are covering one eye. One is maybe po pointing, right. a, yeah, pointing at one eye or, you know, having the, 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 doing the, doing the pyramid pose. You see Beyonce doing it. You see Jay-Z doing it. You see Rihanna doing it. You see all of these different yeah, characters sweet. holding one eye or, or, or maybe putting, uh, doing this symbol here with three, that's six, six, six. What is that? That is all a an ode or showing their loyalty to Horus who is the Antichrist so yeah so you know your grandmother would go out every, very early in the morning catch the first rays of the sun as the sun rises from the east then she would program her day using the energies thereof the rays of the sun would burn their farms, would burn the farms of her neighbors, yes. leaving their harvest destroyed. But rain would fall on her farm and her harvest would be plentiful. And everyone had to come to her to buy food. And many would become her slaves and she would rule over them like Horus of Egypt. 
when Horus says, My wrath will be turned against the enemy of my father Osiris, and I'll put him beneath my feet in my name of Red Cloak, he's saying that he will fill the earth with witchcraft and sorcery, and that he will defeat the righteous one, Jesus Christ. But we know that Horus is a liar, and he will be utterly defeated. He said that he will fill, you see, he will fill the earth with witchcraft and sorcery. And the Bible says, speaking of the Antichrist, the Bible says that craft will prosper in his hand. Which kind of craft? Which craft? Which craft? So Revelation verse 19, verse 20. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. Those miracles are what? The workings of witchcraft and sorcery. Like you see when Moses when Moses uh, uh, produced a snake, even Pharaoh was able also to produce snakes. Yes. The, his magicians. Everything that uh, Moses was trying to do, Pharaoh was also showing that his magicians are capable of doing the same. Yes. So the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. That's the future of Osiris and Horus. That's where Ho Horus is going. Horus is going straight into Revelation 19.20 which is the lake of of fire but he doesn't want to go alone so the machinery of everything that's taking place hollywood social political economic the the, the world economic forum world health organization united nations all of this is to gather the people to deceive them to turn yes. away from god so that they can all be cast into the lake of fire with him this explains that even false prophets can produce produce miracles but they cannot bear the fruit yes that's yes. how we only they can cannot be bear good fruit to to tell them they cannot bear the fruit of the holy spirit mm -hmm. but they can produce uh, miracles they can perform miracles they can have um, good sermons they can speak well in public they they, they can do everything but the fruit is yes. where we are able to discern so is horus the bright and morning star Wait a minute. Revelation chapter 22 verse 16. Jesus speaking. He says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Jesus himself is the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Well, let's take a look at ancient Egypt. Let's go back to the days when Moses was born. It had been almost 400 years since Joseph and his brethren had moved from Canaan to Egypt. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Another pharaoh who did not know Joseph had assumed the throne over all of Egypt and had enslaved the children of Israel. Almost four centuries had passed since then. Satan had been expecting a savior to rise up from amongst the Hebrews, so he launched his plan. His strategy was to kill all of the Hebrew male children and prevent them from becoming saviors. This would reduce the number of men available to fight and help to prevent a possible uprising in future. That's in Exodus 1.15. Then in Exodus 2.10, Pharaoh's daughter names her adopted son Moses because she drew him out of the waters. Pharaoh's commandment of casting a child into the river to drown is a child sacrifice offering unto a few different gods. That child sacrifice offering is the same thing we see happening now with abortion and abortion planned parenthood. Centers, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Children going missing. Yes. And then also this this surrogacy, surrogacy th thing is is spreading like it's becoming a business. It's now not about helping somebody who is barren to have children. It's a business of manufacturing babies for sacrifice. Let me put it that way. Yes, or to have for, no parents. For for the black market because if you if you can afford to to buy 12 surrogate mothers to to have babies for you you can you can do it and whatever you do with those babies afterwards nobody will question because they are, they are under your care they are yours yes now look at the various gods that when if you cast a child into the river there are gods of the river so we know that when Pharaoh was demanding that male children that are Hebrews be cast into the river, these are the gods that were being worshipped. Number one was called Apis. He's the god of the Nile. Can you see Apis here? Mm -hmm. That's how Apis looks. 
you can see his horns and you can see a sun disc over his head. Mm-hmm. In other words, every morning he would worship those gods. Yes, and sun worship was central to Egypt. And guess what? It is central to our society even today. Number two, Isis, the goddess of the Nile. That was the number two god that was goddess that was being worshipped. Remember, Isis is a goddess of fertility. Mm-hmm. She wants them to have children so that those children can be offered as sacrifice. The kingdom of darkness it. needs blood. Why? Because the life is in the blood. Is God providing provision for the kingdom of darkness? No. So where do they get their energy? Where do they get their the the life force from from with which they function? They get it from humanity. Please don't abort no matter how you got pregnant. That does not give you the right to abort. Every person deserves to live. Yes. When you're aborting, you're sacrificing Actually, to these Actually, it's, it's, it's a ISIS. sacrifice to Isis. You're sacrificing to Moloch. You're sacrificing to Horus, the Antichrist. They need blood. That's why they want you to kill the, to the child. They, that's why they want you to be very sexual so that you can have a child out of wedlock. The, the Bible says that he knew us even before we were formed in our mother's wombs. So God knows that baby even before the baby entered your womb. God knew that baby. So what gives you the right to take that life? You know, what makes you feel like you have the right to kill that innocent soul? Please, if, if you have done it, repent. But if you have not done it, you, you can still put your life straight with God and have that baby. All right, so... And the third god that they were sacrificing to by casting children into the rivers was called Kanum. He's the guardian, so-called guardian of the Nile. And the fourth is Tefnut, a goddess of water and moisture. Remember Tefnut? She's in the Egypt, the, the nine, the Egyptian Ennead, the, the nine my goddesses. Was worshiping mm-hmm. every morning. So the goddess of water and moisture, dew and rain in ancient Egyptian religion, also at times a lunar deity. Lunar meaning of the moon. So when somebody loses their mind, you call them lunatic. lunatic. Yeah. Associated with the cycles and the power of the moon. A water goddess in a desert civilization like Egypt played a key role in their civilization because Egypt was a, a desert. You know, so a water goddess would play a very key role. But she was associated with the powers of the moon. And you can see her. You can see her image here. Her hep, her face is that of a lion. There's the sun disc above her head with two serpents. I told you that the serpent was red and brown. The one I saw, my grand, and even the colors are similar. Mm-hmm. Wow. Number five is another god they call Sobek. Sobek has the head of a crocodile and the body of a man. You can see these abominations. He's often depicted with the head of a like crocodile. Hybrid. Uh huh, a hybrid and a crown composed of ram horns, a sun disc, and feathered plumes. Crocodiles live in the Nile River, so Sobek was largely considered a protective deity. The other god that was being worshipped as they cast babies into the into the um, river was uh, Anuket. Anuket is a daughter of Ra, a goddess of lust. You can see her here, holding the Egyptian, the Ankh. The Ankh. Yeah. yeah. There, it's like all the gods are it's actually, the ankh. Actually, you can see the T where, where where it comes down as a T. That's the fertility. That's like um, that's where the 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 cervix. It comes all the way up to the cervix, and then the fallopian tubes on either side. Yeah, so that's the symbol of their fertility and and whatnot. But for them, for fertility, for these gods and goddesses, is procreating at a time when you have no business procreating. You know, children being being abused sexually all right it is in the masonic cult yes it is the abuse of children sexually to pass on the evil spirit from one man to another now the ancient egyptian goddess of the cataracts of the nile is this is this goddess here a consort of kanum the egyptian god who was called the protector of the river nile number seven is happy i don't know why his name is happy but he's not it's not that he's gleeful and happy (laughs) but He's Egyptian. He's the Egyptian god of the annual flooding of the Nile. And you can see him depicted here. He's and they show him in duality because 
one represents the northern Egypt and the other represents the southern Egypt. But the Nile would flood every year. And I told you, these, the, the Egyptians believed that behind everything that took place, there was a God behind it. All right. So the annual floods of the Nile filled the land with rich silt or fertile soil on the river's banks, which allowed the Egyptians to grow their crops. The ancient Egyptians believed that the god Hapi was responsible for this. In other words, as far as the ancient Egyptians were concerned, there was a god or gods behind every area of existence that either supported life or ended it. And even after life was over, there were other gods who would carry you into eternity. Satan did a great deal of work deceiving the ancient Egyptians and entangling them in religious beliefs, practices, and rituals that only further entangled them and drove them further away from the knowledge of God. So, yeah. So that brings us to the 10 plagues. The first plague was when God turned the river Nile into blood, which was a demonstration of the absolute power and supreme authority of God over the various gods, number one, Apis, number two, Isis, number three, Kanum, number four, Tefnut, number five, Sobek, number six, Anuket, and number seven, Hapi. That's Exodus 7, verse 17. Exodus 7, 17 says, Thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. Yeah, you see, these goddesses were supposed to be protectors of the river or protectors of the water or protectors of Egypt. They could not protect and neither could they turn the water from blood back into water. So God was demonstrating his power. Yes, absolute supreme authority. So yeah. this is number two, the plague of frogs, a judgment against Hecate. So you can see Hecate here, the pla a face of a frog, a head of a frog and the body it appears of uh, some kind of a female. How my grandmother had bewitched my dad using the frog. Remember how I mm. explained in the documentary? Yes. And, and uh, my dad was like vagabond. Nothing, he like he would not progress. Everything would just be in circles, just in one place, stuck in one place. Yes. Yeah. And she was feeding the frog. Wow. So to the ancient Egyptians, the frog was a symbol of fertility related to the annual flooding of the Nile. They were not supposed to be killed. In Exodus chapter 8 from verse 5, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields, and they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. So seeing dead and stinking frogs across the, across the country was a major blow to the psyche of the ancient Egyptian because it said that the gods in which they trusted were overpowered. <laughs> they were rotting. Uh, they were rotting. So, the third plague was the plague of gnats. Exodus 8.16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out your rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. This plague was a judgment upon Seth, the Egyptian god of the desert, and Sans and his father Gab, Egyptian god of the earth. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. Exodus 8.19 So this destroyed the Egyptians' belief in Set and Gab, those two gods. Number four was the plague of flies. Judgment upon the god Uajet, or Wajet, a cobra with wings, and Sekhmet, the warrior goddess and goddess of medicine. Can you see the, can you see Uajet here? Uajet was closely associated in ancient Egyptian religion with the eye of Ra, a powerful protective deity. This, this is Satan. In Exodus 8, 22 and 23, 
But Uajad could not protect the Egyptians when swarms of flies came in unto their homes and their bedrooms and their stores and all over their food and all over the temples. Even Pharaoh's palace, I think he got royal flies. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so Exodus 8, 22 and 23 says, And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, and I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. So the Egyptians believed in their god Uajet to protect them from any form of affliction. But this time the flies swarmed in the Egyptians' areas while the land of Goshen where the Hebrews lived was completely peaceful. Flies bring sickness and disease. You know, everywhere they land, they vomit. So this plague proved that the, the God of Israel was greater than the gods in whom the Egyptians trusted. This was also a huge statement to the priests and the world of witchcraft at large because the Egyptian witchcraft was completely backfiring and the land of Goshen where the Hebrews were, were living were flourishing. This was making the Hebrews more powerful than the Egyptian with every step. Here is Sekhmet, the warrior goddess and the goddess of medicine who could not protect or prevent the spread of disease on the Egyptian when on the Egyptians when God was on the move. This proved that God, the God of the Hebrews, was greater than the gods of Egypt. The minds of the Egyptians were completely confounded with every plague. It was every plague was a major statement to everything they had ever learned. Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. The fifth plague was the plague of the cattle. The judgment of the death of the Egyptian cattle the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the oxen, and upon the sheep. That was a major blow to the Egyptian economy. That was a major catastrophic blow to the Egyptian stock exchange. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Exodus chapter 9. For if thou refuse to let them go, God is talking to Pharaoh, and wilt hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon your cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous moraine. Moraine is diseases that kill animals and livestock. And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. And there shall be nothing die of all that is the children's of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died. But of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. So, so Pharaoh ch sent to find out, hey, did any of the cattle that belonged to the children of Israel die? not one but all of the cattle in in the economy of of egypt perished so well it doesn't say completely all but i mean yeah all the cattle yeah it actually says all the cattle of egypt died but of the cattle of the children of israel died not one all right so the fifth plague defied the egyptian gods hathor and apis Hapis is the sacred bull Apis was the son of Hathor according to Egyptian mythology. Hathor was a major goddess in ancient Egypt. God was steadily destroying the entire economy of Egypt while protecting and providing for those who trust him. You can see Hathor here with a sun disk and, and horns mm -hmm. above her head. And here's Hathor again inscribed in a hieroglyph in Egypt, in ancient Egypt. And here is Apis with the sun disk above his head. You can see Apis again. But wait, guess where else you can see Apis? Wall Street. There's Apis. The charging bull of Wall Street is really Apis, the offspring of Hathor, a mother goddess of Egypt. We showed you already how the US dollar currency has Horus. On the currency, the eye of Horus above the pyramid, the, that means that the economy is 
headed in the direction of the service of Horus. And the only way you are not serving Horus is if you are born again. Because Jesus said, he that is not for me is against me. And he that does not gather with me scatters abroad. So if you are not serving the Lord Jesus with your life, you're serving Horus by default because you have to work. The charging bull of Wall Street is really Apis, the offspring of Hathor, a mother goddess of Egypt. When God destroyed the Egyptian cattle and left the Hebrews' cattle untouched, it sent a powerful message to the very foundational belief system of Egypt. The gods they trusted in were not as strong as they thought. Hathor and Apis were the crux of the Egyptian economy. Livestock was a sign of wealth. The death of their livestock was, a, was now a sign of Egyptian economic collapse. Number six, the plague of bulls. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace and let Moses sprinkle it towards the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. And it shall come and it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh and Moses sprinkled it up towards the heaven. And it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. Didn't I mention how Adronia was using ash mm -hmm. to bewitch people? She, oh. she would burn the, the, the photo and gather the ash mm -hmm. and then use the ash, put bury the ash in a, in a, a fiber a door and then she used it to program their lives. Wow. And then now God, <laughs> oh mm -hmm. my God, God is exposing the enemy here. The hmm. plague of boils was a judgment upon several gods of Egypt, Sekhmet, Isis, and Shu. Of course, they were supposed to be gods that can heal and gods that can protect. Sekhmet being a goddess of war and the destroyer of the enemies of the sun god Ra was also associated with disease and healing and medicine. She couldn't protect the witches and the sorcerers. Isis was believed to provide healing spells to benefit ordinary people. She couldn't protect them either. And then there was Shu. The Egyptian god of peace, lions, air, and wind. Remember that he took the, the he took the ash and cast it up into the air. So Shu should have been able to do something about it, but could he? No way. So when Moses and Aaron took handfuls of ash according to the word of the Lord and cast it into the air in the sight of Pharaoh and the Egyptians began to break out with boils, but the Hebrews were fine and healthy, the message hit home. But Pharaoh's heart was still hardened and he would not let God's people go. That brought, that brought us to the seventh plague. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews. I love how he calls himself the Lord God of the Hebrews. Let my people go that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. Why is he doing this? That thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up. God is saying, I made you Pharaoh. Don't get it twisted. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people that thou will not let him go, let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Send therefore now and gather your cattle. Any beast that will be in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth your hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all of the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven. And the Lord said, sent 
thunder and hail and the fire ran along upon the ground. The Bible says the fire ran upon the ground and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. Hmm. That's for Exodus 9, 13 through 26. So this plague was a judgment upon Tefnut and Set. Tefnut was the Egyptian goddess of moisture, air, dew, and rain. So when hail came down and she could not stop it, it destroyed Egyptian faith in her. <laughs> this was Tefnut being proved wrong. Set was the god of storms, violence, and disorder, amongst other things. When God sent the hailstorm and the temples of Set and Tefnut were bombarded with fiery hailstones of destruction, the Egyptians understood that there was a mightier god than the ones they had entrusted with their lives. Set is often dis depicted as a muscular band with the head of a Shah, a strangely looking beast composited of, composed of several animals such as an aardvark, a donkey, a jackal, and a fennec ox. The animal has a curved snout and a long and long rectangular ears. You can see, you can see how this guy Set looks. Meanwhile, in the land of the Hebrews, which was Goshen, there was not one single drop of hail or rain. The children of Israel were supposed to tell their children and their children's children about the power of God from generation to generation. That brought us to the eighth plague because the heart of Pharaoh was still hardened. He would not let the children of Israel go. And the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, and that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know that I am the Lord. And, the, and Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locust into your coast, and they shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue, that which was escaped, which remained unto you from the hail, and shall eat every tree which grows for you out of the field, and they shall fill your houses, and the houses of all your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor your fathers' fathers have seen, since the day that they were upon the earth, unto this day. And he turned himself and went out from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's servant said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young, with our old, with our sons, with our daughters, with our flocks, and with our herds will we go. For we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go and your little ones. Look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord for that ye did desire, and they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. All right, so, and the Lord said unto Moses from that moment when they left, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt, for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even all that the, the hail has left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night, and when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt. See the east wind. Oh, my My grandmother used to send wind to destroy people's lives, and now God, God mm -hmm. is disorganizing the kingdom of darkness using the same weapon that the enemy uses. Mm -hmm. And oh, the locusts wow. went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they before them there. Before them there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such, for they 
covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened and they did eat every herb of the land and all the and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left and there remained not any grain thing in the trees or in the herbs or in the field through all the land of Egypt now then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and he said I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you now therefore forgive I pray thee my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only and he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord and the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea there remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. That's Exodus chapter 10 for, from verse 12 to 20. So this plague was a judgment upon the ancient Egyptian god Osiris. Renenulet or Renenutet, Renenutet and Set. Osiris was the Egyptian god of fertility, agriculture, the afterlife, the dead, resurrection, life and vegetation in ancient Egypt. Remember? So Osiris is the most powerful of all the gods in the ancient Egyptian pantheon. You see him, you remember he was posing like Chadwick Boseman and yeah. Uh, so the so plague had in Pharaoh's heart so that he can destroy all their gods. Yeah, he wanted, he was he, he was judging Egypt. It was judgment. It was done. Egypt was done. The plagues of the locusts was a staggering defeat of the ancient Egyptian psyche because it demonstrated that even Osiris was no match for, his, for this god. But despite this, Pharaoh still would not let the children of Israel go. And that brought us to the ninth plague, which was darkness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. <laughs> and Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They saw not one another. They couldn't even see each other. Neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones go with you. And Moses said, You must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. For thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. <laughs> but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from thee, take heed to thyself, see my face no more, for in that day that you see my face you shall die. And Moses said, You have spoken well, I will see your face again no more. <laughs> That's Exodus chapter 10 from verse 21 to 29. So, they, that's that they were in a position now Moses was his confidence was through the roof you know <laughs> Moses was talking like a yeah. big shot now I Moses a I saw, God. yeah and that's the kind of confidence God wants <laughs> yes. us to have God wants all of us to have that kind of confidence we serve a powerful God amen so the ninth plague was a judgment against the Egyptian sun god Ra Remember, that's the God that they worship. That's the God. To them, the sun was everything. So three days of darkness. That was that was just, that destroyed their religion. As you can see, the Egyptian sun god Ra. You can see him here again with the, the head of a falcon. Even Ra is, was in darkness. Yes. <laughs> so Ra, also given the name Re, is the sun god of ancient Egypt. He is one of the oldest deities in the Egyptian pantheon and was later merged with others such as Horus, becoming Ra Harakti, the morning sun, Amun, the noonday sun, and Atum, the evening sun, associated with primal life-giving energy. You see? So Raharakti was a combination of morning sun and and Horus, and can you see that Horus, the, the worship of Horus is the Antichrist, right? But we know that Satan himself will possess this Antichrist completely. So Ra is the Egyptian word for sun as a solar deity. Ra embodied the power of the sun, but was also thought to be the sun itself, envisioned as the great god riding across the heavens. So three days of thick darkness proved that the Egyptian god of all gods, the sun god Ra, was nothing before the almighty god of the Hebrews. 
Nevertheless, the homes of the Hebrews had plenty of lights. And that brought us to the 10th plague. The 10th and final plague was a judgment upon Isis, who was supposed to be the mother goddess who protects children. The death of the firstborn of Pharaoh was a judgment and a statement that the offspring and firstborn of Isis, who is Horus, the equivalent of the Antichrist, had been struck down. You see that powerful prophetic statement that God was making? Too good. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth, the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take the blood and strike it in the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So they should smear the blood on the top and on the left side and on the right side, forming a cross. Yes. Wow. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remains of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 12 from verse 1 to 13. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out, take you a lamb according to your families, kill the Passover, and you shall take a branch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts of the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your house to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to your sons forever. This is where this, the, the, the festival of the Passover or the, the feast of Passover. It's not a festival. It's the feast of Passover comes from. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he has promised that you shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? You then that you shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle and pharaoh rose up in the night he and all his servants and all the egyptians and there was a great cry in egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead and he called for moses and aaron by night and said rise up and get you forth from among my people both you and the children of israel go serve the lord as ye have said also take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also <laughs> <laughs> and the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste for they said we be all dead men Exodus chapter 12 from 21 to verse 33 can you see Isis with her son Horus here is Isis and her son Horus but the dead 
the death of the firstborns of all Egypt, including Pharaoh's firstborn, was a statement that not only could Isis not protect the Egyptians, but the hope of the Egyptians, the future, the security, and the wealth of Egypt was now completely destroyed. The God of the Hebrews had laid waste to the entire Egyptian economy. Egypt was the superpower of their day. It is the equivalent of seeing the United States collapse with plague after plague until finally the economy is completely destroyed and all their firstborns are dead. The goddess of fertility, maternal protection and wealth, Isis, was totally defeated. People may think that these ancient gods are no longer worshipped, but I beg to differ. Pharaoh still demands the sacrifice of children through abortions. Well over a hundred million children have been sacrificed in abortion clinics. Clinics. People have no idea that the founders of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, Margaret Sanger and the rest, are witches. The entire music and entertainment industry is not for the sale of records, but for the souls of men, for the advertisement of sin, because sin is the offering that mankind offers unto the gods. The god of ancient Egypt, the gods of ancient Egypt are the very gods being served today. And if you look at the Freemasons temples across the USA, you will realize that just as the ancient Egypt was littered with temples built unto the sun god Ra and Isis and Horus, the Freemason temples today are built unto those same gods. The Egyptian god Horus can be clearly seen on the US $1 bill. Horus is the son of Osiris, meaning the son of Satan, which is the equivalent of the Antichrist. Horus is also a god of war and demands constant supply of blood and sacrifice. This is why wars will not cease because the economy is driven by providing offerings unto the Egyptian pantheon of gods who rain down wealth on their followers in exchange. This is why Jesus asks, in Mark 8, 36, for what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The economy of Egypt is the economy of America and the whole world. The river of blood is endless. The industrial scale plunder of the souls of men and women and children and the end thereof is hellfire. The entire system of the Egyptian pantheon, which was passed on from Babylon to Medo-Persia, then to Greece, then to Rome, which is the last and final empire which we're living in now, before Jesus comes and destroys it all. The whole system is designed to send the souls of men to hell and the foundation of it is the financial system. The whole system is the industry of hell and the entire machine is a system tied to the financial system that will draw men away from God into eternal damnation. That's what the whole thing is about. That's what the whole world financial system is about. The worship of Horus, the Antichrist, the son of Satan. That's who all the celebrities in Hollywood work for. Horus is their boss. Horus is their God. That's what all the symbolism in all of the companies and all the industries and businesses and governments and nations and peoples are about. That is the bottom line, the worship of Horus. So, hey man, this I believe is just part one well, of two. the gods of Egypt. But, you know, what we want you to understand is that these gods are still being worshipped and the way people worship them today is through sin. Mm -hmm. For every sin, there is a god that presides over that sin. Yeah, and it's being promoted and there are people who are being given money to promote sin and those are the so-called celebrities. Yes, so if you follow a celebrity, you're going to find yourself serving the God of that celebrity and for instance, if you're, if you're engaged in immorality, your God is ISIS, your God is not Jesus. When you repent and turn away from immorality, then your God is Jesus. But as long as you're still living in, in sin, your God is Isis, your God is Hos Osiris, your God is Thoth and the rest of Anubis and the rest of them. So, yeah. and, and you know, God loves all of us. Don't be deceived. But if you bring a secular artist in charge to entertain believers, you, you don't know the spirit that is controlling this secular artist. You don't know the covenant that the secular artist is in, the God that he's serving. And then you're mixing the holy and the unholy. And the profane. Yes, in, in the name of God loves all of us. Let them repent and give their lives to Jesus. And then now they will be able to walk uh, with you as a body of Christ. But as long as they're in sin, they cannot be one with you. Exactly. And if they're standing in front of a congregation and they're ministering or they're singing, 
they are imparting a spirit to the congregation and the yes. congregation is receiving it. And so what will happen? Immorality will continue. Defilement will continue. The mixing of the holy and the profane will continue. That is the operation of Satan. He wants to mix the holy with the profane. Unless you're one with them, then you can invite them because the Bible says don't be equally unyoked with unbelievers. Yes. The Bible says the wicked are overthrown and are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. So if you are righteous and if and you consistently, your house will stand, but the house of the wicked will be overthrown. And we saw that with the successive empires, the Babylonian empire went up, came down. The Egyptian empire went up, came down. Then it was the Medo-Persians. It went up, it came down. Then it was the Greece. The Greeks went up and came down. But we still study uh, in the universities Greek Greek uh, philosophy is, uh, is that's what is studied in all of the universities yeah. and those same gods are still being worshipped with different names now we're in the Roman Empire which is the final empire it is now coming to a close and so there's not much time left and so if you want to if you want to subjugate and put sin under your feet you have to develop a prayer life yeah. Otherwise, the appetites of serving these gods is very powerful. It's not possible to stop the life of sin without Jesus. But keep coming back to him and keep praying. Pray. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. So intensify your prayer life. And the appetites that used to hold you in bondage will leave you. And yes. you'll be free. And whenever Jesus met uh, with the sinners, he he would he would reach out to them and change their lives, and you would see a changed person. They would not live in sin after meeting with Jesus. But if your pastor claims to be uh, praying for sinners and you don't see any sinner repenting or turning to Christ, but rather coming to entertain you and pulling you to the world, then you might be in a wrong place. You need to think twice. You need to think twice. You need to get out of that place. When Jesus, because they use their excuse a lot. Oh, Jesus yes. rubbed shoulders with, with sinners. sinners. Yeah, he hung out with the sinners. Yeah, but you can see that after they hung out with Jesus, they, they repented changed. of their sins. They turned away from sin. At this but time, if, it's the pastors who are changing. And, and, and the sinner is not changing at all. He's continuing comfortable in his sin. Comfortable in his service to Osiris and to Horus and to Isis. Comfortable in his service to the gods of Egypt. So... If you are wise, turn away from those gods. The Bible says, be thou transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. You do not want to serve the gods of Egypt, which are still prevailing today, which are still um, controlling the financial system. And we're not saying that you should not handle money, by the way, by showing that the Hor Horus is on the dollar bill and whatnot. We're not saying that you should not handle money. We think you should be very financially stable. However, we want you to know the system that is ruling this world, that ruled the world of the ancient Egyptians, is still ruling today. They're still worshipping Satan on a, glow, on a worldwide scale. So it is important that we come out from among them and be ye separate. Yeah. That's what God is saying. Amen. Amen. I, I feel there's somebody who wants to give their life to Christ. Amen. And and then yeah, we can give them a chance. Yes, yes. Amen. So just let's pray and and you can receive Christ and then we'll pray. Uh, say, mighty Father. Mighty Father. I have heard. I have heard that you sent Jesus. That you sent Jesus to die for my sins. To die for my sins. Please. Please. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I believe. I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. That you raised Jesus from the dead on the third day. On the third day. And he has ascended. And he has ascended. And is seated. And he's seated on the right hand. On the right hand of power. Of power. Please forgive me of my sin. Please forgive me of my sin. Blot out my transgressions. Blot out my transgressions. Make me a new creation. Make me a new creation. And show me where I can learn your word. And show me where I can learn your word. And lead me into a place where I can be baptized. And lead me 
to a place where I can be baptized. And give me godly friends. And give me godly friends. Who can help me grow. Who can help me grow. And lead me to honest teachers of the word of God. And lead me to honest teachers of the word of God. Where I can learn of you. Where I can learn of you. And do your will. And do your will. Make me a child. Make me a child. Of heaven. Of heaven. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, you're born again, learn God. Yes. Learn God's word Mm -hmm. and then do it. That is the whole duty of man. Mm -hmm. To learn God and to do his will. That's it. That's the whole duty of man. Yes. And any information about our ministry is in the description box. You can just go there and you'll be able to find out on how maybe those of you who want to buy t-shirts and you want to buy books and you want to support our ministry, you can also check out on our websites www.lifespiritual.org, www.lifespiritual.com. Or if you want to support our charity cause, you can visit www.wildshare.com. Amen. Amen. And with those few words, we love y'all. But Jesus loves you more. I remain Erika Mukisakimani, a.k.a. Mama Maisha of Mami Zion. And I'm Baba Zion. Stay tuned for Gods of Egypt Part 2 because yes. we're going to expose modern day Egypt next. And be blessed. God bless you. <laughs>